All right, we are recording now. Um, welcome to Back to Basics, Navigating Inspections. As I mentioned, I hope this is interactive and you all will chime in. We can talk about some of the hurdles and challenges um, that you all have faced with inspections. But I think, you know, everybody would probably agree with me that, um, and I've been saying it for several years, probably for those who have been in the business a long time, you probably tell me it's been this way for 30 years. But, you know, I found that inspections are typically the most tense part of the transaction for all parties. And it's even more so right now with the way that our market has been the last couple of years with multiple offers. And I try, you know, as I'm counseling my bu both buyers and sellers, as we, you know, go into inspections, I try to have a conversation with them to let them know, you know, here's what my experience has been with inspections. And it's kind of battle of the wills right now. The sellers are saying, you know, we put our house on the market, we sold it quickly, multiple offers. Um, you know, I can just put it right back on the market and sell it again to somebody else if you start getting squirrely asking for repairs. And meanwhile, on the flip side, the buyer's mentality right now is that, hey, you know, I wrote you a good offer. Um, I'm at or above your list price. You're getting, you know, oftentimes right now in, in a lot of scenarios, the sellers are getting more than they listed the house for. So then in turn, the buyers want everything fixed. They want a perfect house. There is no such thing, um, but they want it as close as they can get. And so that dynamic right now has really um, made inspections even more challenging than they have been historically and they've always been challenging. It's always tense. You know, I tell sellers all the time, I'm like, take a deep breath. We're going to get an inspection report. I have never seen an inspection report that had nothing on it. There's going to be stuff on it, um, but you maintain the house well, and hopefully there's nothing that's a big deal breaker and, you know, something huge. And if there is, we'll work to get you through it. We'll work to get you through it. It happens every day. Um, so that's, you know, I kind of, give you a lay of the land and what I tell my clients to try to get them prepared for inspections. And I think as, as professionals, that's, you know, that's part of what we can do to help get our clients through this is really make sure we're preparing them on the upfront um, for not just the process, but you know, how the dynamics in most transactions tend to shift or change during the inspection time period and let them know the types of things you're seeing and, and how that, you know, what the buyer could be thinking and what, you know, if you're representing a buyer with the sellers probably thinking, and that way it puts everybody kind of at ease um, and gives them, you know, the better you can prepare them, the better your outcome is going to be, I think, with inspection. So let me um, share my screen here and we are going to dive in. I've got a couple of slides for you and then really we're going to just kind of talk through with those of you that are on here, some challenges that you've had, things that you've seen come up. <laughs> in regards to inspections and, and how we can kind of help each other and brainstorm and, and get people through them. But first, I do have some slides for you. Um, I'm going to go over some, oh, my first slide didn't even show up. Um, I'm going to go over some do's and don'ts to kind of set the, set the table here. Then we're going to look at what the contract actually says, um, both the, the residential real estate contract, what it says in the inspection paragraph, and then we're going to look at the inspection notice and resolution. I'm going to point out some things that a lot of people tend to miss or that they don't read or just don't understand that tends to get us into a little trouble as we're trying to navigate through inspections. And then I've got a couple of scenarios for you um, to kind of talk about things that either I've experienced or as I've helped agents get through inspections, um, you know, horror stories and whatnot that I've heard. So um, let's start with some do's and don'ts. I start with a don't. Um, and, you know, I've kind of talked about this. Assume your clients, don't assume your clients actually read the inspection part of the contract. Um, make sure that you're providing your clients with a good explanation of how that inspection process works, both for your buyers and sellers. Uh, if you were in the contract to close class yesterday, you saw my checklist and you got a link to, to two templates in there, one for the buyer, one for the seller. And those are, um, I have an email, kind of a form email that I send out to my buyers and sellers both as soon as we're under contract that explains what the next steps are, sets the expectation, explains to the seller what they can expect with the inspection process, um, and then same for the buyer. And then I've got, you know, kind of a PDF that's attached to it that really goes into kind of the contractual um, with inspections. But I found that the more you can educate them and prepare them, the better off you're going to be able to get them through the inspections. None of us like surprises, uh, neither do our clients. So 
got to do stuff on the upfront just to try to mitigate um, and avoid the, the pitfalls. Um, as the agent, don't pick the inspector. Um, I know that's, we get asked all the time by our clients, I don't care, just whoever you want to use. That is probably, you know, inspections tend to be the most litigated issues right now during transactions. Um, and one of the things that is going to land you in the hot seat is not giving your sellers or your buyers, excuse me, the ample opportunity to pick their own inspector. Now, they might still not pick their inspector and lean on you to just kind of schedule somebody, but at least give them ample opportunity in writing to choose their own inspector. I have an, another, you know, in that inspection explanation email that I send to my buyers, I give them a list of three inspectors. You need to give at minimum three. Um, and then I ask them, I provide website for the inspectors. I ask them to do their research. I offer to them if they have their own inspector, I'm happy to schedule inspections with that person. If you don't, here's a list of three. Um, you know, do some research and then let me know who you want to choose. Typically, most of the time, as you all, you know, probably happens in your world too, the buyer calls me back or emails me back and says, I don't care, just schedule one of them. And my response is typically, okay, I know you're available Monday at noon, so I'm going to, I'll call all three of them. I'll go down my list, call them, and just I'll, I'll pick who's available. Um, but don't, don't pigeonhole yourself into picking an inspector without providing them at minimum three different options and, and at least encouraging them to research those on their own. Even if they don't, you've got to give them the opportunity to stay out of the, stay out of hot water on that. Um, the other, the other thing you don't want to do is dictate what inspections should be done. I know as you know, they want our advice and they want our opinions and that's okay to tell them you know, gosh, on, you know, this size home or this age home, typically buyers are doing whole house termite rate on a sewer line scan and a chimney scan, but really you've got so many other options and I want to make sure you've got all options in front of you before we decide what, what inspections um, you want me to schedule. On the do, I put be the source of the source. I tell them what the common inspections are, but maybe common to them where they're moving from or of high value to them would be a mold inspection. And that wasn't on my little list of the most common inspections. So I make sure that I've got a comprehensive, either an article or um, a resource that I'm linking to when I send that inspection explanation email that um, gives them the opportunity to see beyond what I think Christian thinks is a common, you know, inspection to have done on this property. What, uh, what else is available? So make sure that you're at least offering that type of information to them and you're not telling them we need, we need to do a termite a raid on a whole house. And next thing you know, that sewer line collapses a week after they move in and they, you know, tell all their friends, their friends are like, why didn't you have a sewer line scan done? Well, my agent didn't recommend it. And guess who's getting sued? All right. If you have questions or anything to add as we go along, feel free to put it in chat or unmute yourself and chime in here. Um, <clears throat> next don't that I have is try to guess or speculate on the cost or severity of repairs. It's really easy to do as you're standing there with the inspector and he's going through his, um, you know, his findings and the buyer's gonna look at you and say, well, how much do you think that costs? Or they're gonna look at the inspector and go, how much do you think that costs? Most of the inspectors won't tell them and there's a reason, it's liability. Um, and as agents, unless we have a pretty good idea how much something, and when I say a pretty good idea, I mean, you've gotta have really good knowledge on this stuff and most of us don't. Um, don't try to tell them, oh, that's not that big of a deal or, oh, that's a $10, you know, Home Depot repair if it's something that really you're not quite sure about. Um, I had a situation about a month ago, um, I was representing the buyer and the deck was a huge deck, massive deck and had probably, oh, I would guess 15 to 20 cedar posts that had all rotted out and they all needed to be replaced. And the buyer looked at me and goes, how much do you think that's gonna cost? And I said, from my experience, a lot, a lot. We need to have an estimate done. Um, the sellers ended up agreeing to have it fixed prior to closing. And it ended up being three times what my buyer had estimated that it would cost. Um, and the inspector had actually kind of told him ballpark of what he thought it would cost. And that's where my buyer got his number. Thank goodness that we didn't ask for a credit in lieu of repairs 
based on what the inspector told us it would cost because it would have been um, astronomical and he would have been coming after me to get money. So don't try to speculate and don't try to tell your clients what is and isn't a big deal. What's a big deal to you might not be a big deal to them and vice versa. Um, I try just as business practice, I try to keep them focused on safety concerns and um, you know, code issues if, if they're fixable. You know, a lot of times they're not um, because of when the house was built, but I try to keep them uh, you know, focused on health and safety issues. And that's what I tell them as I prepare them preparing them as we go into inspections. I put this on here, don't tell them how you feel, tell them what you know. Um, again, don't, don't tell them, oh, that's not that big of a deal. Well, it might be a big deal to them. Don't ever leave an inspector alone with clients in a property or let an inspector access a property alone without, you need to have informed consent from the owner of the property. And you get that through the listing agent and you get it in writing. So if you've got a vacant house, the buyers are out of town or can't be there, the inspector wants to go in, you feel like, okay, the inspector is gonna be there, they've got an iBox key, I don't need to be there. Wrong, 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 that's a thousand dollar fine. Um, just so you know, you need to get, you need to reach out to the listing agent. I would do it in an email and say, my inspector would like to inspect the property by himself. Um, you know, are you and the seller okay with that? And uh, get a response from them before you just let somebody into a house. It's not only a MLS fine, it's also a, a code of ethics violation as well. I see too often where agents are incredibly lazy and I get it. You don't want to sit there for three hours and do nothing. Um, but I'll tell you, I, I have tried to show up for every single inspection that I've had for buyers in you know, my 13 years. And that is the time that I really get to sit there with a the buyer and we get to know each other pretty well and have some good conversations and um, develop that, that deeper relationship. It's not always fun to sit there and you don't always like every one of your buyers and don't want to sit there with them. Um, but you need to be present. You need to be present just to hold their hands, answer any questions, make sure they're staying out of the inspector's way. Um, but yeah, don't, uh, don't ever leave them alone. Don't abandon them. And if you can't be there, then you need to find somebody that's licensed that can be there to let the inspector in and stay present the entire inspection unless you've got, um, got consent for the inspector to be alone. You do not leave, ever leave an inspector in a property with a client. Don't ever put that on them. Any questions on any of those? We're gonna go into some, some contract stuff next and then some scenarios. Um, <laughs> but anybody have questions or, or anything they want to add on the do's and don'ts list? It's This is not an all-inclusive list. There's a lot of them, um, but I felt like these are some, some pretty important ones to, to kick us off here. Christian, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I have a current contract that's going through, and um, my buyers were deciding that they didn't want an inspection, which I highly advise them against three times in a verbal conversation, then made sure I documented it in the email and in the dot loop that I sent to them to wave. What are, what are some things that you can do to try to and really encourage them to? I mean, they don't have a construction background. I don't think it's a good choice. Is there anything other than covering yourself you recommend doing? You know, I would, I would just ask them the questions. Why, you know, why? Why, you know, why do you not want to have an, can you tell me why you don't want to have an inspection done and, and see what they say. Um, and sometimes it's not just what we say, but, you know, provide them with some information from a third party resource about why they should have an inspection done. If you can find out, you know, their reasoning behind not wanting to have one done, try to find a resource or two that, that you can send them that just says, you, know, you might want to reconsider this. Um, but how you handle that sounds perfect in that, you know, you have the conversations with them, you document it in email, you document it in dot loop, make sure you cover yourself on all of that. They understand that they're, they're doing that against your advice. Um, but, you know, it's, it's their choice. And I, I put down here and thank you, Jenny. I know she's on the call. Um, I was having a blonde moment yesterday. I couldn't remember the ninja line that's at the bottom of the slide here. You control the process. The client makes a decision. Um, so sometimes it doesn't matter how much how much educating you do with them, they're going to make the decision they're going to make and there's not much you can do about it. Do sometimes, do lenders require them to have an inspection though? 
Um, lenders typically don't, unless it's a VA or an FHA and they're going to require a termite with destroying insects. Um, and then the, you know, with FHA and VA, that, that, they don't require an inspection be done. It's the appraiser. When the appraiser goes out, they're looking for some issues. Um, and, and they could come back and, and want some repairs done, peeling paint, missing handrails, um, broken glass, missing um, heavy appliances, that, those types of things. Um, but typically, I've never seen where, as anybody else, I've never seen where a lender has required a whole house inspection. Um, I've seen them where they obviously require a, a wood destroying insects. Um, and the appraisal process, you know, can come back with some repairs, but I've never seen one where they require it. If you do, that, okay, thank you. Any other questions before we move on here? I want to, um, as we move in here, oh, there's a first slide I was looking for. They're, of course, they're out of, they're out of order. Um, I want to make sure that we're paying attention to what the contract says. I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I get calls from agents and they start explaining the, the scenario to me and then, well, you know, this is what I think and that's what the other agent thinks. And I always say, have you read the contract? And nine times out of 10, nobody's read the contract. Um, and I can guarantee you the client didn't read the contract. So I want to point out a couple things here. This is the base contract. Um, paragraph 13 deals with inspections. I'm not going through this line by line. This is not a contract class. Um, but I do want to point out a couple things here. I'm going to see, I've never used this. I'm going to see if I can use it. Um, can you all see that? Oh, good. I think that works. I've never used this little tool. Let's see what Spotlight does. Okay, I wanna make sure that we understand um, first and foremost, and we talked about this yesterday, that the inspection period, everybody gets confused. When does it start? Does it start on the effective date? If I have an effective date of today, May 28th, is today day one, and it's not. It's after, um, well, that was a bad little, deal there. Um, it was, it's after the effective date. So your effective date's May 28th. May 29th is your first day. That's day one. So make sure that you understand that it is after. It is after. Um, and that it's at the buyer's expense. To, you know, I, I don't think I've ever had a buyer come to me and go, well, I thought the seller was paying for that uh, for my inspections. Um, this kind of gives them a paragraph. This paragraph right here I had said that, you know, try to be the source of the source when they're asking you what inspections they should have done. This is not an inclusive list, um, but it's a pretty good list. It's a pretty good list to start with. Um, and then the next thing you want to pay attention to in the next paragraph down here is it's the buyer's responsibility during the inspection to do any due diligence and verify any information. So if there's something on the seller's disclosure that, you know, they think wasn't was an, an accurate depiction. That's the inspection period is when they 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 can do their due diligence and need to do their due diligence to um, to make sure that they're comfortable with any variance that maybe the seller had on the seller's disclosure. Now, if it comes back later and the sellers have completely um, fabricated or omitted something um, that was not discovered with inspections or, or couldn't have been discovered with due diligence during the inspection period, we got a whole other issue. Um, but I've had a buyer <laughs> who was an attorney um, who, you know, a couple days before closing decided that all of a sudden he wanted to make a big deal about something that was on the seller's disclosure since day one. We knew about it. He had the opportunity to have it inspected. He had the opportunity to ask the buyer or sellers to correct it, didn't. And then he wants to make a big deal with it about it two days before closing. That's not going to fly. Um, <clears throat> the... Uh, property insurability, we talked about this yesterday in contract to close. Please, 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 please make sure that your buyers are reaching out to whatever homeowner's insurance carrier they want to, um, they want to use during the inspection period. I see this happen often where you get through the inspection period, then they start shopping for insurance. The insurer, uh, the insurance company comes out to do their visual and all of a sudden we've got an issue. And you're past your resolution, your past your inspection time period, we've negotiated a resolution 
at that point, if the if the um, insurance carrier comes out and says, yeah, that roof's a no-go, we're not going to insure the property, you've got an issue. You've got an issue and you're going to have a hard time getting that seller to agree to replace that roof um, without the buyers contributing or paying for it. So make sure you're having that done during, during that inspection process, encouraging your buyers to have that done and explain to them the ramifications if they don't have that done. Um, what else do I want to say on here? The sellers have to provide, I know everybody explains this to them, to the sellers, but they've got to provide access to the property, reasonable access to the property. This is not, I'm coming by every other day to take measurements. Um, reasonable access to the property to conduct inspections, re-inspections, and to do a final walkthrough. Um, so at minimum, you need to be, have your sellers prepared um, for those three opportunities for the buyers to come in. Uh, buyers are responsible for and pay, they're responsible for and will pay for any damages, uh, damage to the property resulting from the inspections. This happens often. Um, probably more often than, than I thought, but th it happens pretty often. But it says right there in the contract, I get calls all the time. Well, the inspector was at the property. Now all of a sudden the shower, you know, shower won't turn on. And, you know, we think the inspector did something. Um, you know, who's, who's going to pay for this? Because agents are now squabbling over it. Well, go read your contract. It says right there that the buyers are responsible for anything. You, know, you got to prove that the damage happened during the inspection. Um, but the buyers are ultimately responsible. And if the buyers want to hold the inspector responsible, that's up to them, but it's the buyers that are ultimately responsible per the contract. Um, you know, this one's important on E, the quality of repairs. The seller agrees, um, you know, they've got to have it done in workmanlike manner with good, good quality materials. What it does not say in there is that it has to be a licensed, insured, and bonded contractor. So oftentimes when I'm doing a resolution, if it's electrical for sure, something that is, you don't want somebody's brother-in-law's sister's cousin to do, you need to make sure you clarify in that resolution that you want somebody that's licensed, uh, insured, and bonded to be doing these repairs. Otherwise, the only, the only obligation that the seller has is to complete it in workmanlike manner with good quality materials. That's it, that's their only obligation unless you specify otherwise in that resolution. So make sure you do that um, if that's of concern to your buyer. And then wood destroying insects. Um, you know, this is outlined on our exclusive right to sell. It's outlined here again. If the seller uh, or if the um, property is bound to, um, to either have evidence of live wood destroying insects or um, previous without treatment, the seller has to have the property treated. This comes up again on our inspection notice, but you do not have to put um, your request for termite treatment on your resolution. That comes up, we'll get to that in a second with our inspection notice. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit further um, because I'm, I'm gonna take it a step further when we get to that inspection notice and resolution. But if, if those are found, evidence that them are found, that seller is paying to treat and you need to have them, make sure you've got them uh, prepared for that. I forgot to click out here to our, to the actual PDF here so we could scroll to the next line. Now, how in the heck do I get rid of that? Um, oh, there we go. Learning something new every day with the Zoom stuff. By the way, I will tell you, I got an email last night on Saturday, May 30th, for all of you on this call, this is critical. You have to update your Zoom. Um, either if, if you're using the app on your computer or an app on your phone, a tablet, make sure you update that application to Zoom 5.0. Otherwise, next week, you're not getting into any meetings. I'll be sending out emails on how to do that, but just so you know. Sorry, rabbit hole, squirrel. Um, okay. This talks about delivery of the inspection report. We're gonna talk about this when we get to the inspection report, but it must be delivered within the inspection time period. This is not the next day after, this is within the inspection time period. And it's critical you explain this to your sellers. I mentioned this yesterday on one of our, I can't remember which, which session it was yesterday, but how many times, I mean, it happened to me this week with a seller, the, you know, the agent's pulling out of the driveway as the seller's pulling back in and the seller's texting me and calling going, okay, what do we have to fix? What do we need to do? 
um, I make sure to explain the sellers on to the sellers on the upfront that they have 10 days to perform their inspections. Even if they do their inspection on day two, we might not see anything until day 10. That's their deadline. That is their deadline. So don't just because they do an inspection, um, you know, day two or day three doesn't mean we're getting an inspection notice and resolution at that point. They might, they might not deliver it to us. It is their right, um, you know, to deliver that anytime within the inspection time period. If you don't deliver it within the inspection time period, your buyer's taking that house as is and we're moving forward. We're moving forward. So really critical that A, you count those days right. Remember day one is the day zero is effective. Your first day is the day after your effective date. Um, let's see here. This just talks, you know, I'm not going to go through every one of these. You all have read contracts before. Um, make sure though, if, um, if this is a, you know, a large property, you've got outbuildings, you've got a shed that's more than 30 feet away from the property, you need to put that in here that it's going to be included. That's an additional structure that's included. Um, can be included with a, uh, with the resolution as an unacceptable condition. So make sure, make sure you're paying attention to that. Um, da, da, da. Down here, I want to highlight L and M down here. Um, it says a buyer's notice of cancellation or offer to renegotiate terminates the inspection period. Inspection period is over and must be accompanied by written inspection reports in their entirety. You can't just take specific pages out or send them just the summary or pick and choose which inspections you want to send them. You have to send them all and you have to send all pages of them. Um, yesterday during our contract to close, I misspoke. If the buyer is taking the property as is, you do not need to provide your inspections. Um, in that case, you don't have to provide those. And I apologize, um, apologize for misspeaking on that yesterday. I always do because I think it's you know, I, I just send them. If the agent chooses to trash them, then whatever, I don't care. Um, but you have to include them on um, on a uh, notice of cancellation or a resolution and include all of them. And then down here is important. Um, I pay attention to this. A lot of people just let this default to five days, which is fine. But if I'm coming up on a holiday, if I know that that inspection time period, if I start looking at days and I'm coming up on a holiday, um, you know, Christmas falls in the middle of the week. I know nobody's going to be around. I'm not going to be able to get estimates. I might screw with that number a little bit and not just let it default to those five days. Now, once you get into the resolution, you can always, you know, buyer and seller can agree to extend, but they don't have to. So just pay attention and look at your calendar as you are, um, as you're kind of looking out and writing the contract. It's hard to gauge that because you obviously don't know when you're doing inspections. The other recommendation that I have as a buyer's agent is don't do your inspection on the very last day of your inspection, um, your inspection time period. If you need to get, you know, a roofing person out there, an HVAC specialist out there, you need to have a follow up on the chimney. You've left yourself zero time to do that. So, you know, I know that inspectors tend to book out, um, but, but try to get that inspection done as quickly as possible for all parties involved. And then don't wait until the last day because um, then you fact yourself into a corner of something, you know, you gotta get somebody else out there. Um, hold on, I've got a question that just popped up here in chat. Um, I think this makes sense. I'm gonna go ahead and read this for the group. The question is, um, if your buyer's buying a house and they just want to do a sewer inspection, that's all they want to do, um, can you cancel and just send the sewer inspection or do you need to have, have done a whole house inspection? Um, you don't need to have done a whole house inspection. Um, what you need to have done is some type of an inspection from an independent qualified inspector. So it doesn't state in here anywhere that, that I saw or that I've read that it, it says what type of inspection you have to have performed. It just has to be a qualified, um, independent qualified inspector. It can't be somebody's brother-in-law saying, oh yeah, I, look, I took a look at it, stuck my head down the sewer, it's screwed up. They've gotta be qualified, but it doesn't say in here which inspection or what, what type of inspection. Hopefully that answered your question. If not, shoot back a text um, 
or chat there and I'll, I'll try to clarify that a little bit. Um, one of the things that I get asked all the time is if you are canceling because of, and I'll use that same example, if you're canceling, if you've done your whole house, your termite, your radon, your mold, your sewer line, if they're canceling just because the sewer line is collapsed, can you just send that report? And I, the way that this is worded, you have to send all. It says all, or actually I take that back. It says applicable written inspection reports. I tend to send them all, um, but because of that word applicable, you can actually just send the one that applies to their cancellation reason um, per what it says there in paragraph L. Um, okay, resolution. Okay, we've talked about that one. Um, I think we're about done on the contract. Does anybody have questions about how any of this is worded on the contract or um, confusion about what the contract says in regards to inspections and resolution? I do want to draw your attention right here um, to one, two, and three, and we're going to talk about this when I get into the scenarios for you, but let's talk about it now. So um, during that inspection renegotiation period of five days, there are certain things that can and cannot happen. One of the things that cannot happen is once a buyer um, sends over a resolution, sends over an inspection notice and a resolution, they cannot backtrack that, rescind that, and send over a cancellation. I've had that come up more than once as I've helped agents, and I've had it come up for myself. Once that resolution time period it has started, you can't un unring that bell. You can't cancel. What the buyer can do, and we're going to talk about this more in scenarios as to why you would do this, what the buyer can do is the buyer can um, accept the property as is. But what they cannot do is rescind the resolution and then send over a cancellation. If the buyer wants to cancel or the seller wants to cancel, things aren't going well, they have to wait until that five days, I use five days because that's the default and, and most common, they have to wait until the five days expires and at 12.01 a.m., they're sending over a cancellation, but you can't do it during that five-day renegotiation period. Either party, neither party can cancel. Neither party can cancel. Lisa, I see that you just um, sent a question in chat. I'll get to that in just a second after I finish talking about this paragraph here. Um, so the, and we'll talk about this more, the buyer can during the resolution period, you don't send over a new inspection notice today and they're taking it as is. There's a paragraph on the second page that comes in a box on the resolution, we'll get to it in just a minute, that the buyer would sign if all of a sudden they felt like the sellers were kind of getting squirrely and they were not responding and you felt like they were going to cancel after the five days expires, the buyer could sign that box and say, we'll take it as is and move forward and the seller then they're locked in. They're locked in. Any questions about that, about those things? Let me read um, as I pause here if you have questions. So um, <laughs> Lisa, that's an interesting scenario. So the, um, oh, I read um, another one there. Let me look. Okay. Lisa says, do I need to have an amendment if the seller wrote that AC was replaced in 2019 and it is in fact a 1998 inspection said original AC when I asked the seller, he said only furnace was replaced, not outside AC. So that was, it sounds like maybe just an honest mistake when he filled out the seller's disclosure. Your buyer is now aware of that. They have done an inspection. The inspection report that the buyer um, paid for shows that the, um, that what the true age of that air conditioning is. I don't think technically you need to have an amendment. Again, I go back to that paragraph up here where it says it's the buyer's responsibility to do their do due diligence. Where are we? Right here, line 465. It's a buyer's responsibility to perform due diligence and verify any information um, that they consider to be material. So they have verified that that air conditioner was not replaced in 2019 and is now in 1998. I don't think that you need to put that in an, on an amendment. Now, if that wasn't discovered during inspections and it was discovered later, then you might, we, I might have a different answer for that. But I don't think if anybody disagrees with me, please chime in. But I don't think you need to do an amendment for that. Um, at that point, you have documentation that the buyer is well aware 
of the correction on that. I'm well aware of it. Okay, um, next one was sent to me privately, so I won't call out name. They had a buyer refuse to give, um, I had a buyer who refused to give their inspections to their agent or the sellers because they were not canceling due to an inspection item. It was after the inspection period and resolution period, they claim they own them. So the buyer, I get this, I'm just thinking about this, that's interesting. I don't know what the correct answer is on that, to be honest with you. Um, so the buyer had the inspections done. Those reports were not, I assume, not sent to the, the agent that represented them, or maybe they didn't have representation, and they refused to give them to the listing agent or the sellers because they said that they own them and they weren't canceling because of an inspection-related issue. Um, it was after the inspection and resolution period. Well, if they had the inspection and resolution period, they should have been delivered at that point in time. If there was a resolution um, that, that came through with the inspection notice, they're required at that point in time to provide inspection reports. And if they didn't do that, you know, that I, this is my opinion, but shame on the listing agent for not asking for those as you're trying to negotiate resolution. Um, if you want to chime in and unmute yourself and expand on that any further, feel free. That's an interesting situation. But yeah, if a buyer just simply refuses to turn over inspection reports, uh, I, you know, read the contract, um, paragraph L, line 540 there. If they're canceling because of um, inspection, they are required to provide those applicable reports. So that was their uh, argument. Um, they were not canceling as a result of any inspection item. So that's why they wouldn't give them. They did give the whole house, but roof and sewer line inspections and chimney inspections, they refused to turn over so that when I relisted it, you I didn't have it. those to give to anybody. Which, oh, which is gonna raise red flags, right? So had they right. already, were they cancel? I guess my question is, were they canceling during the inspection period or had you already gotten no. through inspection resolution? No, we were finished. We'd made all the repairs they did ask for, which were very minor. They canceled. They backed out like four days before closing. Well, so okay. No, so technically, no if they had on the inspection on on during your resolution period, if they have to supply the applicable written inspection reports, if there were not any repairs requested from those other items, those other reports they had done, technically the way the contract reads is they don't have to supply those. So I, they, might, they might not have to supply those, um, even if they did them. They're, they're, I, I'm not an attorney, nor do I play one on television, um, but I don't think they'd have to supply them then. That's an interesting okay. one. That's an interesting one. I've got a couple other in chat here. Um, which part, Laura, which line is that on again on the contract? Are you talking about line L here, um, bottom of page 10, that it must accompany applicable written reports in their entirety? Or are we talking about, I know that I referenced um, up here that it's a buyer's responsibility to perform their due diligence. That's up here. Uh, right under the start of the inspection. I know I just referenced those in the last couple minutes answering questions, so probably one of those. Um, what happens if negotiations go past the five-day period? Okay, so if you're in the five-day period and we, we can't come to an agreement, if both parties are still, are, are still willing to negotiate back and forth, that time period can go on um, what you need to be cognizant of, though, as an agent is really you need to have it in writing that both parties agree to extend the resolution period. If you don't and you just go off goodwill and say, well, we're still talking, so we're just going to, you know, we're just going to keep moving forward. Once you go past that five days at any point during that time, you think you're negotiating all of a sudden you can have a cancellation notice delivered to you. So make sure if you're going to go past that five days, you get it in writing, get it in writing on an amendment, extending that resolution period. Um, if you don't, either party could cancel at any time. So get that in writing to extend, um, but you can go past the five days. And it says right down here, 
um, the last bit in the inspection in paragraph 13, we're on now on page 11 here, the contract, if no agreement resolving it is reached during the renegotiation period, here's your two options. They can still proceed. Um, an agreement must be in a written amendment and signed by both parties to proceed. I have people all the time that do it, they don't get it in writing and then they get shocked when they get a cancellation. Um, they thought they were still negotiating. Uh, and, and then B, here's where it says, uh, either party can cancel by written notice to the other earnest money is returned subject to the provisions in the earnest money. We're gonna talk about this when I get into my scenarios. Um, additional deposits, paragraph. Okay, I wanna make sure we've got enough time to get to the scenario. So I'm gonna flip out of here. We're gonna come back over here. I just wanna take a quick look at your inspection notice and point a couple things out on here. We're not gonna spend a ton of time on here, but there's a couple things on here that you need to pay attention to. And right here at the top is where it says, unless the property is expect, accepted in its present condition. So unless you check paragraph one right here, applicable written inspection reports in their entirety must accompany this notice. It's almost word for word what's over there on paragraph L in the contract. <laughs> if this first box is checked, I wanna talk about this. You know, we go back over to the residential contract and here's what paragraph is it? Paragraph F, bottom of page nine, seller agrees to have the property treated. What this does not say, and pay attention, what this does not say is that the seller agrees to repair damage. It says they agree to treat. But if you've got damage to basement, to joists in the basement, underneath the front porch where the termite dam or where the termites were located, the seller doesn't have to it doesn't have to address that damage per what it says on the contract and what it says right here. If you want those repairs made, that needs to go on a resolution. The treatment doesn't need to go on a resolution, but if you want any damage repaired, it needs to go on your resolution. So don't ignore that little step. Don't ignore that little step. I That bit me in the rear end one time. Um, you know, we've checked box first box up here and then we get to walk through and seller or buyer is surprised that we didn't do the seller didn't do any repairs and I realized that they don't have to all they have to do is treat they don't have to repair and I recommend that you have repairs done because when they go to sell it in 10 years the termite inspector is going to see the same damage and your seller is going to be treating again so have it repaired but if you want the seller to do it, you better put it on a resolution. Um, paragraph one here, this is um, the buyer's accepting it. It was asked, the question was asked yesterday and I will repeat it. It is if the, um, if the buyer is gonna just, if they're gonna do this anyways, they're gonna do box one, they're gonna accept it. Why even deliver the inspection notice? And that's to cover your rear end. Um, make sure the buyer checks one of those boxes that they inspected and the results were acceptable or they opted not to have inspections done. If you just let the inspection period expire, buyers are good moving on as is, you have no documentation that the buyer agreed to accept the property as is. You have their implied consent, but what do you have in writing at that point? You've got nothing, you have nothing. So make sure you go ahead and execute an inspection notice, even though it's just a formality at that point, you need to have this executed and have a copy in your file. Um, the cancellation, copies still have to be attached to that of the written inspection reports in their entirety and must be attached. Um, the buyer requests a refund of earnest money. We're gonna talk about that in scenarios, so hang on to that little nugget. And then you have to attach the cancellation and mutual release agreement. You can't just fling over this inspection notice with no cancellation and mutual agreement. It says right here, it is attached. Not that it should be, but it is attached and it has to be attached. We're gonna talk about that when we get into scenarios and the what ifs and what happens. Um, offer to renegotiate. Um, <coughs> copies of written inspection reports in their entirety must be attached. Um, that uh, this is, you have to attach your resolution here, right? Okay. Any questions? Inspection is pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, Christian? Yeah. Christian, this is yeah. Tina. 
I just have it. And so if you send it and you say offer to renegotiate and you're getting to the 11th hour and the sellers are not responding, can you send over at that time before that five day period ends? We'll take it as is and they're locked in. Yeah, but you don't do it on inspection notice. Once this inspection notice goes out, it's done. I'll show you where you do that. Okay, so you don't, just, you don't resend that just saying, we'll take it as is. No, so that goes can't at any, Yeah, you can't at any time resend the original inspection notice and check a different box. Okay. Um, you can't do that if you're, even if you're taking it as is, you don't do it on the inspection notice. And at no time can you resend it and say, oh, now buyer wants to cancel. Once you've, once you've okay. made a selection on the inspection notice and delivered, you're locked in. You're locked in. Now, if it gets to, that's, I've got that on my, one of my scenarios, so we'll just talk about it now. You get to the 11th hour, the seller's not responding, the buyer's going, oh my gosh, if we don't move forward, I'm going to be homeless. What do we do? Here's what you do on page two. You come down here, last, last paragraph here, and you check this box and you send it over, the, and that box does not require the seller's signature. So that's gonna be somebody's next question. Well, what happens if the seller doesn't sign that doesn't require seller's signature? Great, thank you. Uh, and it says right here in the last line, this election does not require seller's signature to be binding. If delivered prior to the expiration of the renegotiation period, if you have an extended renegotiation period and that's expired and you try to do this, all bets are off. Does anybody have a question, comment? Okay, a couple things I wanna point out real quick on here, um, on your resolution, if you're gonna do this, um, you, everybody is probably familiar with what the resolution looks like. This is where you would outline any repairs. I strongly recommend that you don't reference the inspection report. That's going to be problematic when you have to send this over to your lender. Um, and I know some lenders say, don't even send it to me. We're not gonna discuss that today, that's up to you. Um, but you don't wanna reference the inspection report on here. If you're sending to the lender, which you should, you're contractually obligated to send them all parts of the contract and it's a part of the contract. Uh, you, if you reference inspection report, the underwriter is gonna ask for that inspection report and that could open up a whole can of worms. Um, so I would recommend not referencing inspection report on there, not saying item 1.253. Just don't be lazy, list it all out, list it all out. And if you need additional pages, you can put that on here. Sometimes I'll type it on a Word document so I make sure I don't miss anything. Um, adjustments in price or terms. Make sure if you're checking this box, there's two lines here. If the seller is already paying closing costs, so you already have $2,000 in seller paid closing costs per the original contract, and now the buyer is asking for an additional $2,000, you wanna make sure that you put that on here. So it says seller agrees to pay additional, buy, additional buyer's closing costs of $2,000, plus any amounts previously agreed to for a total amount, what would you be in your total? 4,000. It's not your total for inspections, it's your total cumulative for the whole contract. And make sure you're checking with the lender that they're not over um, overstepping the allowables um, on seller paid closing costs because there is a there is a threshold there. I think it's 1% of the loan amount, um, but I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. Make sure if you're if you're getting up there, you know, if, if the seller wants to give a credit for a roof make sure the buyers, the lender's okay with that. Don't assume that some of those big credits are just gonna be fine. Um, this talks about payment for corrective measures and what happens if the seller's gonna pay for it ahead of time, outside of escrow, outside of closing. Um, and then what happens if um, the unacceptable conditions, um, da, 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 what is, hold on just a second. Oh, this just says that any previous, you know, if you've gone back and forth, revise this resolution, any previous, um, you know, requests for repairs that might still be in the inspection reports, it's just notification that the, the seller's not going to do that. They're only agreeing to what's on this one. What's on this one. 
Okay, any questions on that before I know that we're uh, getting close to an hour and we'll go a little longer if you want to hang out. I understand, totally understand if you've got to go. Um, I should have made these about an hour and 15 minutes because we tend to go long in every one of them. Um, any questions on the resolution before we dive into some scenarios here? And some of your questions might be answered as we go into scenarios, but I'll pause for a second. I had to step away, Christian, for a bit. Uh -huh. And one of the things when you were first starting, I think that when buyers are in a bidding war, sometimes buyer's remorse sets in. So I think that's yep. a why for as an agent for us to be mindful of. If we have the buyer know it's coming, um, and then as part of inspections, if the buyer's remorse is coming, sometimes that can fuel them to ask for unreasonable things or whatever. So I think that you pay top dollar and then maybe you regret it or right. somebody bought two and they didn't have to pay so much, then the remorse sets in. So. Yes, that, that, that dynamic, that happens all the time. And we've seen an increase in cancellation rates because, and it's that dynamic, that buyer's remorse. Um, you know, we have to, unfortunately, right now with, you know, in, in a lot of at price points, the buyers have to make very, very quick decisions um, and often feel like they're making decisions too quickly. And then it bites us in the rear end when we get to inspections, because then they're like, oh gosh, this really isn't the house I wanted. I could only be in this house for, you know, 10 minutes. Um, now I'm coming back for inspections and I'm in the house for two hours. And I don't like it. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody that I think is on here, Jenny Recht at, at the Blue Valley office. Before we had crazy, you know, uh, supply issues, I used to tell my buyers all the time that um, you need to see a house twice before you make a decision. And Jenny was telling me her, her clients the same advice. And even if it's a quick, rapid, you know, you got a line of people out the front door, she makes them walk outside take a deep breath and come back in the front door and take another look around. Um, you know, there's some things that you can do to, to help, um, you know, mitigate that buyer's remorse, but you know, it's unfortunately, it's kind of the way it is right now. Um, real quick, I just wanted to pull up the in its present condition addendum and please make sure that you use this thing with extreme caution, um, especially if you're gonna check the third box, especially if your, if your buyer is going to waive inspections and not do inspections, have them sign this. This is another cover my rear end as an agent form. <laughs> Make sure they understand that they're foregoing um, both their rights to inspections. And then if the seller is saying that you also have to forego your right to cancel, that, that they completely understand that. More often than not, I see the second paragraph checked here where the buyer can do their inspections essentially what this is saying is they can do their inspections as outlined in paragraph 13. The seller's not gonna make any repairs or treatments and or treatments would destroy an insect, no go. Um, and buyer waives the right to renegotiate, but they could cancel. So they can't, they can't renegotiate, but they could walk away or take it as is. Now, we all know when we get in the reality of a transaction, you know, even if you check paragraph two, oftentimes you go back to the listing agent and say, look, we don't wanna walk away you know, it, the hot water, you know, water heater is leaking carbon monoxide and it's got to be, this is a huge safety concern. You know, sometimes you can get, get the seller to realize that, or I'm going to have to replace this thing regardless. I might as well uh, move forward with this buyer. Okay, let's get to some scenarios here um, and some what ifs. During the renegotiation party, and we've talked about a lot of this, so these should be pretty quick, most of them. Uh, during renegotiation period, either party can terminate negotiations or cancel the contract, true or false? No. During that renegotiation period, you can't just stop negotiating and cancel. You have to wait until after that five days is up and then you cancel. And then you cancel. Um, this is exactly that scenario that Tina had, had talked about. Um, you know, the, the sellers aren't going to, you realize sellers aren't going to play ball. <laughs> buyers don't want to lose a house, so what do you do? You have them sign, check the box on second page of the resolution and take it as is, if they're comfortable with that. Um, and then the sellers can't cancel. Sellers are moving forward. Sellers are moving forward there. 
Okay, parties cannot come to an agreement and the buyer decides to go ahead and cancel the contract. Is the earnest money refunded to the buyer? Put it in chat, what do you think? That one we have not talked about. The earnest money does not automatically go back to the buyer. And you need to make sure that you don't tell your buyer that if they cancel their because of inspections, they're automatically going to get earnest money. They're not. Um, the earnest money is, it has to be mutually agreed upon. If you remember correctly in the inspection notice, it says right down here, buyer requests a refund of earnest money. Buyer's always going to request a refund of earnest money if they cancel on inspections, but it is not an automatic. And a lot of people don't know that. And they're not counseling their buyers correctly because they're telling them, oh yeah, if you cancel, you get earnest money back. Sellers might say, eh, no, we're just going to make you, make you sit here. We don't care. Buyers send over a cancellation and sign it. Guess what can happen? We're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, here it is. In the example above, the sellers have received the cancellation mutual agreement signed by the buyers. When can they relist the home? When can they relist the home? Immediately. As long as the buyers have signed that cancellation, it doesn't matter if the seller signed it or not, they can relist the house. They can relist the house. They can put it back to active status. Oftentimes why they don't sign it and send it back is because there's a dispute on the earnest money. The sellers want to keep the earnest money. The buyers have requested a full refund. The sellers can say, nope, I'm going to make you sit here for a while. I'm going to make your, you know, keep your earnest deposit sitting at the title company and make your life a little painful because you just canceled and screwed me. And I can relist. I can relist. Now, if the sellers are the ones that delivered the cancellation, they can't relist until the buyers have signed it. So it doesn't go both ways there. Doesn't go both ways there. Oh, I forgot to put my multiple choices up there. <coughs> they can relist in that situation immediately if the buyers have signed the cancellation. If the, if the sellers were initiated it and buyers haven't signed, sellers have to wait. You have to wait. Okay, so inspections were done by a previous buyer. Does a listing agent have to disclose and provide the previous inspection reports? Yes, you do. If you have them. If you don't have them, you can't provide what you don't have. And you're going to have to explain that to any buyer's agents that are looking for them. You can say all that we were delivered was the whole house inspection. The other inspections were acceptable, so the buyer never provided us to them, and I don't have them. They refuse to, to give them up. Um, can your buyer perform new inspections and should you recommend that? This came up yesterday during class. Yes and yes. Now they might not take your recommendation, but just because a previous um, inspection report was, was done and you have a copy of it, you still need to recommend to your buyer that they have a independent inspector, qualified inspector come out and do it on their behalf, somebody that they choose. So make sure that you're still counseling. They, again, that quote at the bottom, you control the process, they make the decision. Um, you've got to educate them and tell them they still have the ability to have their own independent inspection done. They don't have to take the previous buyer's inspection. They don't have to. Okay, inspections were done by a previous buyer. This is a good one. Um, inspections were done by a previous buyer and foundation issues were discovered. The buyer walked. So the seller had multiple vendors come out. They had a couple different foundation companies come out and give estimates for the repairs. Um, they figured they better go ahead and have it fixed before the next buyer asks them. And the results varied from needing significant bracing to one, one guy came out and said, you just need to seal the cracks. You're fine. Just let's epoxy these cracks and, and move on. The seller chose, obviously, as most sellers would, to just have the crack sealed. Do they need to disclose the other estimates and bids for work that were not done? I apologize, I think that's a typo. Um, do they have to disclose or is it okay for them just to say, we had the, the cracks epoxied and not say that somebody else recommended that it needed to be braced? What do you think? Put it in chat. I'll wait till we get a couple answers in chat. I, I won't embarrass you. If you wanna just send them privately, you can, um, but, 
I want to hear what you think. <laughs> Do you need to disclose the other estimates? Even though the repairs have been completed, even though the repairs were completed, the epoxy, the cracks were sealed. You do. You have to disclose. You need to disclose that there were repairs that were recommended that were not done. That you had it, you had it sealed, but what you didn't do was the bracing that somebody else recommended. So yeah, you need to disclose that. That that's a tricky one. I can I can see where that might foul up some people and go, oh well, we had the work done. Why would we go back and disclose that somebody recommended we do something else? You need to disclose it all. You need to disclose it all. Okay, um, I'll move fast here because I know we're two minutes over. Uh, buyer's agent delivers the inspection notice to the listing agent. He informs the listing agent the resolution will follow shortly. They haven't picked up rate on yet, so he wants to go ahead and get. We're up on our uh, tenth day, I need to get that inspection notice over. So I'm going to go ahead and spend the inspection notice and then I'll do the resolution once I have the radon picked up. Well, the radon isn't picked up until the next day and thus the, the resolution isn't sent over until the next day. When does a renegotiation period begin? The renegotiation period begins when the delivery of the inspection, upon delivery of the inspection notice. But do you have a valid inspection notice because you don't have what they're offered to renegotiate, you don't have your resolution of unacceptable conditions attached. So do you even have a valid inspection notice? We ran into this a couple years ago. And you don't have a valid inspection notice. So if you've but if you've now gone over your inspection time period that was 10 days. You sent the inspection notice on, you know, 11.59 on day nine or day 10, and you don't send your resolution over until day 11, guess what? Your buyer's taking the property as is. That's why I strongly recommend that you don't wait until the 11th hour to have inspections done. Um, okay, it is 11.35. Those are all the scenarios that I have. I just wanted to open it up for any questions, for you all to bring up scenarios. I know we're a couple minutes over, but we'll hang out for a few minutes here. Um, and uh, we can talk about some unique situations, which I know that we've all had. Inspections are a ton of fun. So feel free to put, throw stuff in chat or unmute yourself. Um, Carol says you, she assumes you can send an amendment to extend the inspection period. Absolutely, yes. I would send that. Make sure you've got it signed, though, before your inspection period expires. Make sure you get that thing signed by all parties. Uh, if you think you're going to be going over, you know, give everybody enough time. Give the courtesy of the listing agent, uh, you know, give them a day or so to get signatures from the seller. Don't send it to them at 9, you know, 11.59 on day 10, give them some time to get that thing signed and give yourself some breathing room. But yeah, if you think that you're going over, put it on an amendment. So somebody uh, put in chat, she said it privately here so not everybody can see it, but she's wait waiting for an inspection notice. It's the last day, she sent a radon report and resolution but not the inspection notice. I swear, I swear. Um, it used to, I think we've reworded the contract since then. This hasn't come up for a couple years, but I was told by, this was a couple years ago, that an agent decided, buyer's agents decided to go ahead and share the inspection report with the uh, listing agent just so they could start preparing the seller for what was on it the inspection notice and resolution were gonna follow. And the way the contract used to be worded, and they've changed it since then, was a delivery of the inspection report opened that resolution period. The listing agent knew that, and knew the buyer's agent didn't know that. And so day one of that five day period started two days before the buyer agent even realized it started, and guess what happened? Nobody came to an agreement because that period expired and the seller canceled but I think they've reworded that now, so I think you're okay. But yeah, sending over reports and resolution, but no inspection notice. 
I swear, people. Get your stuff together. Get your paperwork together. It's not hard. It's not hard. Thank you, Daly. I appreciate you being here. All right. I can't believe you all don't have your own scenarios or questions. I know you've asked some throughout chat and it was great. Um, if you have any that you want to chime in with, feel free. <laughs> 